Australia, the oldest, most extreme continent on Earth. Nowhere else do you find snakes more venomous, wildlife more bizarre. Over tens of thousands of years, people have adapted to this untamed land. They have endured its extremes and gradually learned to love it. From the rich jungle to the red desert to the snowy mountains. But in this vast island of wild beauty, the crowning jewels are Australia's national parks. Between the Australian mainland and Antarctica, swept by the gales of the Roaring Forties, lies Tasmania, Australia's largest and wildest island. Even in midsummer, the strong westerly winds that encircle the Antarctic can bring storms and sometimes snow. But this island stands resolute like a fortress against the ravages of time. The rugged mountains have created a citadel of unique habitat, protecting the last remnants of a lost world. Tasmania took shape in the tectonic rage that wrenched Australia from the supercontinent of Gondwana 45 million years ago. More than one third of Tasmania is dedicated to national parks, registered as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Ancient sheltered valleys of temperate rainforest have been preserved. The high humidity and mild temperatures create an almost closed canopy, which acts like a greenhouse dome. It's a magical world, a dream in green. But when the sun goes down, it can seem like a nightmare. as it echoes to the sounds of weird creatures. Here in the primeval forest, it's as if the evolutionary clock stood still and around it developed some of the strangest animals on the planet. An egg-laying mammal with a duck's beak, a four-legged carnivorous kangaroo with a face like a dog and stripes like a tiger, and the devil himself a flesh-eating marsupial with the scream of a banshee and the appetite of a vampire. It is summer at Cradle Mountain in remote northwest Tasmania. In 1922, this almost untouched wilderness was designated as the Cradle Mountain Lake St. Clair Scenic Reserve. From the rugged basalt peaks of the Cradle Mountain Massif to Lake St. Clair in the south, it's a place like nowhere else on Earth. For those who care to visit, there's a trail that winds its way 80 kilometers over the roof of Tasmania. This is one of the world's great treks through mountain heaths and moorland and into the dense forests. There are over 4,000 lakes in this part of Tasmania. Most of them formed in the last great ice age. An average annual rainfall of over two metres maintains a rainforest supporting the ancient biota of Gondwana. In 1936, a remarkable animal called Benjamin died in a Tasmanian zoo. Despite the name, she was actually a female 
and although she looked like a dog, she had a pouch for her young. Benjamin was a Tasmanian tiger, or thylacine. At the time of European settlement, two centuries ago, there were thousands of thylacine on the island state of Tasmania. Sadly, Benjamin was the very last known of her kind, extinguished by bounty hunters after four million years in this land. This is a wild and inaccessible wilderness, the domain of the unexpected, the extraordinary, some might even say unearthly. You may even encounter the devil himself. If you stood here at this spot 10 million years ago, you might have been stopped dead by the same scream that pierces the forest tonight. When the first white settlers came here two centuries ago, they agreed it was the cry of the devil and the name stuck. Until about 600 years ago, devils inhabited all of Australia. Today, they live only in Tasmania. And even here, they are fighting to survive. Strange things happen in Tasmania, like falling in love with a savage, bad-breathed, big-toothed scavenger. But that's what happened to Wade Anthony. Wade decided the last icon of the Tasmanian wilderness must not go the same way as the Tasmanian tiger. He became the devil's advocate. He left the National Park Service to dedicate all his time to trying to save the little Tasmanian devil. These are bones that have been crunched by a Tasmanian devil and, and cleaned up by a Tasmanian devil. These are the leftover of, of Rufus Wallaby leg bones. And you can see this is a jawbone of a Rufus Wallaby. Now, a Rufus Wallaby makes up a fairly primary diet of the Tasmanian devil. Uh, so we, we know that devils, you can see that there's, um, it's an active game trail by the markings on the ground and obvious evidence of the bones. So devils are moving through here and we will locate a camera on the tree just beside the game trail and we should be able to pick up photographs of devils. On the way home, Wade gets a call to tell him that a devil has been hit by a car. At night, they frequently scavenge roadkill, which saves them from hunting live animals. But sometimes they become the roadkill. He's a prime breeding animal and, uh, and in, in fantastic body condition, so it's a shame to see him kill. Wade examines him for signs of the facial cancer, but this animal is healthy. I am affected to see them killed on the road. When the population was at 150,000, then it wasn't a major concern. It was, it was inevitable it was going to happen, that animals would be killed on the road just because they were in such high numbers. Um, now, with, with the demise or the, the, the shrinking population, it's a real shame to see them killed on the road. It really is, I mean, the devils need all the help they can get at the moment for the survival of the species. At the foot of Cradle Mountain, Waldheim Chalet was constructed of rustic natural materials by the plant-loving Austrian Gustav Weindorfer. Together with his wife Kate, a century ago they built this humble hostel so that other people could experience the exquisite wilderness for themselves. Many did come to this secluded resort, enjoying the warm hospitality of the botanist couple. Gustav preached to his guests that this precious area should be protected by being made into a national park. During the First World War, Gustav suffered two tragedies. First, his wife died and then, because of his Austrian origins, he was accused of being a spy, although he'd been an enthusiastic Australian for decades. Weindorfer was vindicated when he learned in 1922 
that at last the area between Cradle Mountain and Lake Sinclair had been designated as a national park. Today, the waterways of the southwest are travelled by a different breed of pioneer, men on a mission to help save one of the rarest creatures on Earth. Biologist Jim Thomas is one of the leaders. The orange-bellied parrot is uh, very endangered. There are less than 200 birds in the wild, and uh, they're all found in southwest Tasmania. The parrot breeds only here, and migrates across the storm-swept Bass Strait to winter on the Australian mainland. It's fallen victim to feral predators like cats, and its mainland feeding grounds have been reduced by development. Three state governments and national park scientists have joined forces to save these precious parrots. The birds are now being bred in captivity, where they're being prepared for the wild. The idea is to release them to this remote corner of Tasmania, where they once flocked in their thousands. Today, birds will taste freedom for the first time, although it's not quite that easy. For several weeks, they've been acclimatising in one of the world's most remote bird cages. And now it's roundup time. Up. And look at that orange breast, his black W, so he was bred in Tasmania. The little parrots are tagged, so their movements can be tracked over the precarious journey ahead. these parrots have to learn to be wild again. Feeding tables are provided until they learn how to find grass seed for themselves. This is a rare opportunity for Jim to observe the parrots and every move is scrutinised. I rate the success of the program quite high birds have been captive bred, they've been released here, and we've had birds come back. So we are getting the results we want, and to improve those results, we need to um, uh, concentrate our efforts more on captive breeding and releasing of the orange-bellied parrot. Eventually, they make that final leap and fly away. While the orange-bellied parrot struggles to survive, so does the cranky little Tasmanian devil. Although the devil is the emblem of Tasmania and famous with tourists, hardly anyone gets to see one in daylight. So Wade created a tourist attraction and bought land adjacent to the national park and slowly got the animals used to being active in the daytime. OK, folks, as you can see, there's a, there's a few devils moving around out there. Um, these guys are primarily a nocturnal species in the wild. Well, in the wild, they're, they're, let's say, fully nocturnal. So most people don't get to see them in the wild because of that reason. Wade handles the orphan devils until they become tame, like little Ossie, who has become the star attraction at the Cradle Mountain Devil Park. A fearsome carnivorous beast is transformed into a cute little animal that you can touch and pet. So this little guy, his name is Ozzy. 
Like the Tasmanian tiger, devils were hunted by farmers because they suspected them of killing calves and lambs. They became protected not long after the Tasmanian tiger became extinct. In proportion to its size, the Tasmanian devil has the strongest jaws in the entire animal kingdom. Probably eight or nine is the maximum size they reach. It's an eating machine and can consume 40% of its own weight in half an hour. Devils are a solitary creature. In the wild, they live on their own, but they are a social feeder. So they're an opportunistic feeding animal. So if one devil makes a kill or finds a carcass, pretty soon it's another one's going to smell it or, or hear devils squabbling over it, and they'll, um, there'll soon be more than one animal feeding on it. You've probably heard that devils are an aggressive animal. They're not particularly aggressive, they're just highly competitive. And it's, as I said, it's generally, generally for food or the right to mate. As a young boy, I grew up with Tasmania's wilderness as my backyard, and uh, my father used to take me out Every weekend we would go camping, either fishing or bushwalking, cam camping as I said, and we would come across a lot of different animals that lived in Tasmania and a lot of endemic species. So I soon realised that you know, we, we were, Tasmania was quite a special place and we had a lot of wonderful things here. Where could an animal possibly exist that had webbed claws, a duck's bill, a beaver's tail, and lays eggs and feeds milk to its young. The virgin waterways of Tasmania are a prime refuge to the platypus, Australia's unique egg-laying mammal. The platypus hunts insect larvae by sensing their electric fields with highly effective receptors in its bill. When the first specimens of the platypus arrived back in London in the late 18th century, they were declared hoaxes. For more than a hundred years, experts argued over whether it was a bird or a beast. Eventually, in 1884, it was officially declared in a worldwide telegram that it was a whole new category, the monotreme. The only other monotremes are the echidnas. The echidna probes for ants and insect larvae. Both these monotremes have thrived in Tasmania, where they remained isolated from outside influence. But the same can't be said for the Tasmanian devils. In 1996, a photographer made a horrifying discovery in the Tasmanian forest. One picture he took showed strange areas of swelling around the mouth of a devil, the symptom of a contagious disease now known as DFTD, devil facial tumor disease. A devil task force was established to try and get a picture of the progression of DFTD. The devil population that recently was so numerous has been reduced to the status of an endangered species. Shut off from their familiar environment, these normally aggressive animals are generally calm when trapped in this way. Some even go to sleep. Team leader Samantha Fox handles the wild animals with great care. Noise upsets them. Anything that they're not really sure about. Um, you know, and a lot of the noises that they're going to experience while they're here with us, um, they haven't heard before. So people's voices, um, some of the really crunchy, crinkly stuff, it's, it's all new stuff to them that they haven't heard before. So um, you try and, where possible, lessen the human part of the experience for them. In addition to a general health check, the team records the size and age of the animals, and they give the devils names. Um, what are you going to pick, Phil? 
We'll call him Clyde. Clyde? Yep. Great. We'll call him Clyde. We'll cross that off the list. We're hoping to fill these. As apex predator, the devil is very important for the entire balance of the Tasmanian habitat. If it should become extinct, another less popular successor could likely take its place. I guess one of the, the pressing things that people are most worried about in Tasmania is um, the presence of the fox. And they're worried that if we lose too many devils, that allows um, a gap in a niche for devils, uh, for, for foxes to infiltrate further into Tasmania. It is pleasing that all the animals examined so far have been in good health. A quick picnic lunch and a phone call from the only place to get mobile reception. They are back at work. careful to clean every trap thoroughly so they do not become contaminated. And then case number 35. They've caught a good strong female. But when Sam looks in her mouth, she is devastated to find a small swelling on the fixed palate. This devil is infected. They take samples for analysis. The cause of DFTD is now believed to be related to a single infected female. But the cancer has spread because of lack of genetic diversity in the small devil population. This is probably a little further into the site than I was expecting it to be, but, um, you know, it's, it's very hard to tell. You can't. It's not really a case of expectation. And that's, you talk about a disease front and you sort of think that it's going to be, a lot of people would imagine that when you talk about a disease front, it's going to be a straight line and it's moving across the state in a straight line. And it's never going to be like that. It's going to be highly variable depending on habitat, on abundance of devils, um, on a whole lot of other things. After the examination, Sam releases the female revealing the wounds from the constant battles that many Tasmanian devils suffer. Scientists believe that the devils transmit the disease by constantly biting each other when eating and mating. Whatever the cause, the disease has spread remorselessly through the devil population in less than 20 years. And so far, nothing can be done to stop it. It's predicted that unless the spread of the disease is stopped, extinction in the wild will occur within 35 years. On the extreme west of the island, remote and almost uninhabited, is the only place left where the devils don't suffer from DFTD. These healthy devils gave local farmer Jeff Taylor an idea And now people come to this region just to dine with the devil. To attract Tasmanian devils to a viewing site, the first thing you need is a very healthy population of devils in the landscape. And then the other thing you need is some techniques to attract them to a site. So I collect roadkill, I leave it out in front of a shack, this old fishing shack that we use as a hide, and I also drag a scent trail through the landscape on the nights that I try and show people the devil. Jeff opened his Devil's Beach restaurant five years ago for this uniquely Tasmanian dining experience. While everything looks improvised, as though it's on its first day, this is part of its special charm. A final spotlight check 
and all is ready to go. A baby monitor allows us to hear the devils cracking the bones, while the guests enjoy their own haute cuisine inside the restaurant. I never expected when I started showing people Tasmanian devils that I would become fascinated by them. I'd had a farmer's view that they were a stinking filthy animal. As it's turned out, they're an intriguing animal, one of the most intriguing animals I've ever seen in my life. And so every night I come down here, and this is night number 1010, um, I'm excited. The Devil's Restaurant caters for both humans and animals. The first guests arrive at sunset. And we'll shut the door so we don't let any mosquito, this one. No, well, no. the other guests arise and start yes. roaming around and looking for food. Um, we'll keep the light on for a little while, but then later on we'll have a candle and we'll watch through the window and, and turn everything down low. Okay, take a seat. I've need to check my lights and things. Here's some reading material. While inside, the humans enjoy the fine aromas of French cheese, Italian bread and Australian red wine. Outside, a dead wallaby radiates its own seductive aroma. Some guests come back for a second visit. We came here eight years ago and it was in a guidebook that we... From eight years ago. From eight years ago, which we were rereading uh, prior to coming here for this visit. And uh, we saw like it a there. It before and we left and I thought, wow, that sounds fantastic. We researched it a bit and uh, looked on it. Yeah. And then called and very similarly happily he was going happily out. It was the right night. <laughs> we called uh, two days ago and it was perfect. Suddenly a crackle comes through the baby monitor. A single female on the prowl. The rich aroma of the roadkill tantalizes her palate. While the devils may prefer dining alone, their raucous appreciation of the meal soon attracts other guests. Devils have long facial whiskers to give them a sense of personal space. As long as everyone keeps their distance, they can gorge quite happily in a group. But when whiskers brush, all hell breaks loose. Tempers fly and fangs tear into live flesh. It is this secret observation of the wilderness up close that guests love so much about the Devil's Restaurant. This is a beetroot dip, okay? Mm -hmm. Australians oh, have beetroot in everything. Okay. The devils are also gorging themselves on Tasmania's famous organic produce. If the Tasmanian devil was to disappear from the forests of the island, there is only one other endemic predator that could possibly fill its niche. The wedge-tailed eagle, a far more elegant scavenger. Bill Brown's home is perched on an empty hilltop, like an eagle's eyrie. And Bill is the bird's biggest fan. In an outdoor enclosure near his house, he's reared a wounded young female. Bill has prepared her for years to return to the wild, but so far in vain. The updrafts of this windy hill make it an ideal place to teach large birds to fly, but she seems reluctant. Icarus was found when she was about six weeks old. Her uh, nest was burnt by a wildfire in State Forest in the north of the state and she was found by some forestry workers and they contacted me and uh, she was singed 
but otherwise unharmed. And uh, I've had her and raised her since then. Bill is dedicated to the education of his eagle. But despite his work, she still retains her wild spirit. Bill is one of the top raptor experts in the country and works as a ranger for Tasmanian National Parks. My initial hope was to release her as, as soon as, as possible when she would normally have fledged. Uh, however, because her feathers were, were damaged from the fire, uh, her first uh, lot of flight feathers were shorter than normal and usually uh, young eagles have slightly longer feathers than adults which gives them a really distinctive advantage when they're learning to fly. Despite all his efforts, Icarus still behaves like the wild creature that she is. She's certainly aggressive, she's certainly not tame. She could be described as imprinted because she responds to me when I bring food and imprinting is a difficult thing because they associate humans. She probably associates humans with food and imprinted birds can, if they're released, can cause problems by being quite aggressive towards humans, expecting to be fed. Bill has built a special device that allows her to move freely and exercise until she's ready to fly. With a wingspan of up to 2.8 metres, the Tasmanian wedgetail is one of the largest eagles in the world. But Icarus's muscles are not used to flight. Passing wild eagles use the rising thermal airflows to soar to altitudes of more than 1,800 metres. Bill is fascinated by this powerful predator of the skies, but concerned about her future. The Tasmanian eagle is endangered for a number of reasons. Uh, there are lots of human threats acting on the population, and also from more sinister types of human activity, uh, like poisoning and shooting. No other populations of wedge-tailed eagles are threatened with extinction in Australia, but they are in Tasmania. A perception within um, the particular sheep industry that eagles were a major predator of live healthy lambs. Many years ago studies have been done and they found that uh, less than 5% were taken by eagles and then the majority of those that were taken were uh, sick or dying. The wedge tail has never had it so good since the rabbit was brought here by Europeans. But numbers of eagles are decreasing through hunting, while the rabbit has become one of the most destructive feral pests throughout Australia. Icarus gets her second lesson of the day, and the strong wind is favourable. She flies at least 100 metres, which for her is a great success. The young eagle feels the wind in her feathers and tries again. Bill hopes to release Icarus soon. He would love to watch her soar effortlessly up where she belongs with her wild eagle kin. The basalt columns of Barn Bluff stand like organ pipes in the Cathedral of Nature. Created from the molten lava at the dawn of Tasmania, millions of years ago. The mountain landscape is the domain of the wombat. This peaceful, bear-like marsupial lives in burrows that they dig with their sharp claws. 
Wombats eat the grasses and sedges of the mountain meadows and have a very slow metabolism. They can take up to a fortnight to digest a single meal. And after all that time, it comes out in cubes. Wherever they go, they leave ample evidence of their passage, treating fences as minor obstacles and marking their territory with their distinctive briquettes. Their natural enemies are Tasmanian devils and eagles, and no doubt the thylacine also preyed on them. But they have their defences. The rump of the wombat is covered with a very tough, thick hide, which protects them from the teeth and claws of its attacker. It's also capable of crushing its enemies against the burrow roof. It's spring in the Tasmanian highlands, baby time. Wade Anthony observes this timeless wilderness every day from the simple house he built with his own hands. Sometimes he brings wounded animals home. When a devil is hit by a car, the mother often dies, but the little baby can survive in the pouch. Many of these are brought to Wade. He rears the young devils with a special milk formula, sold in Tasmania just for feeding marsupials. Some more. These two will have plenty of time to practice because Wade will have to do this twice a day for the next three oh. months. Willem, as we've called him, was found on the edge of the road with his sister next to his mother, which had been killed on the road. Unfortunately, his sister didn't make it through the night, but Willem, he was the stronger of the two, obviously, and, and he managed to, uh, to survive the crucial 24, 48 hours. He was brought into us 24 hours after he was found. And uh, luckily for Willem, he, he took to the bottle very, very quickly. So this was a really positive sign. Once, once they take to the bottle, then generally speaking, they're away and, and you shouldn't have too many problems with them. The second largest predator on the island, also a marsupial, is the spotted tail quoll. I'm going to try and catch this male spotted tail quoll. He's about three and a half years old, so he's in his absolute prime. He's quite a large animal. Spotted tail quolls are quite difficult to handle because they're very, very fast and agile. And they have a, a nice set of teeth as well. Um, so I'm gonna have to be a little bit careful. And they're probably, they're quite difficult to catch, so we might have a bit of fun here for a little while. Some species of the Australian mainland quoll are now extinct, but the birth rate in Wade's sanctuary is high and the future is hopeful. Quolls often have to be moved from enclosure to enclosure for breeding. But first they have to be caught. Despite all his experience, Wade doesn't succeed. He needs help. Spotted tail quolls are the Australian equivalent of a native cat. They tear birds and small kangaroos to pieces with their teeth and claws, and they are excellent climbers. Despite their cute appearance, they were always hunted by farmers. This is where it could be dangerous. 
Although they enjoy a more sympathetic reputation than the Tasmanian devil, they are just as ruthless a predator. Can you put that on the lady? got him. As you can see, they're very fast, very agile, and take a bit of catching sometimes. Thanks, Nicole. For the meantime, I'll place him in this trap. Hopefully. The quoll's bite muscles aren't as strong as the devil's, but they don't give up, not even in a bag. Yeah. Wade started a one-man company five years ago. Now he is sought after throughout Tasmania for quolls and devils. Delicate actions, such as procedures with pregnant devils, he likes to do himself. He's a protective mother. This is Ossa, named after Mount Ossa, tallest mountain in Tasmania. She's a first-time mother, she's a two-year-old. She's a very nice little devil, but all, any, any mother worth of salt is going to become protective. So today we're going to relocate Ossa and her four offspring down to a, to a new enclosure where she gets a bit more sun. Life is not easy for young devils. A mother delivers up to 30 minute babies in one litter, each one no heavier than a few tenths of a gram. She has only four teats inside her pouch. Only the four strongest babies get any milk. The rest are eaten by their mother. The four who have made it this far know how to fight to survive. Now it's time to put them in an outdoor enclosure. For a hundred days, these four youngsters have done nothing more than to hang on tight to their mother's nipples. Unlike their cousin, the kangaroo, the young devils will never return to the pouch for sanctuary. Although they will continue to suckle from their mother. Osa is brought to join her babies. But when she's put into the new enclosure, she feels disoriented and a bit insecure. Hello, Gil. Hello. It's all right. And she wonders what here. Wade has done with her joeys. They're in here. <laughs> That's the quickest way out. You can around Christmas time or very early in the new year, the young will be fully off milk. They'll be on purely meat and water. And once this occurs, mum's done her job. It's, they're becoming increasingly difficult for her. And one night she'll just leave the den and won't come back. I have a two-year-old daughter. She's been introduced to Willem, the little Tasmanian devil I'm hand-rearing. And, uh, she seems to really like devils, so um, 
So who knows, maybe, I'm sure over the years as she grows older, she'll spend more and more time here. And uh, yeah, maybe one day she'll, she'll manage the place. You have, you have to be gentle, remember? That way. Very gentle, very gentle. That way. That way. When Wade left school, he was a successful athlete. But he found himself investing more and more energy into working with animals. Doucement, baby. Tiens, pas trop fort. Holding him. There we go. On a trip to North America, he met a French Canadian doctor, gentle. now his partner. Doucement. Boy. <laughs> Both encourage their daughter to love animals. <laughs> but the difference between animal and toy <laughs> is still a work in progress. Do you like Willem? We're going to do it. We're going to put him in the box. You're going to put him in the box? I think he still wants milk. You can put him in the box. Almost everything in Wade's life is somehow involved in the wildlife of Tasmania. He tries hard to maintain a healthy work-life balance. Okay, you have to close the door quickly, okay? But if his daughter is going to take over the family business, she needs plenty of practice in putting wild animals in and out of enclosures. One of the myths is it's a savage beast. It's an animal that's going to attack you in the wild. We hear this every day. This is simply not true. This, is, this myth has come about because one, it's called a Tasmanian devil, and every photograph or bit of footage you see, the devil's got its mouth open and it's roaring and screaming. But in reality, they're a very, very shy animal and they're a species that most people aren't lucky enough to see in the wild because of that fact they're incredibly shy. On his days off, Wade likes to get on the water. Instead of going fishing this weekend, he decides to take his family on an eagle spotting expedition. There's a pair of sea eagles that, um, that live just up here on the river. We see them pretty much daily. They come over and, and looking for food, obviously, so um, I'm just checking to see. Today, there's no sign of the sea eagles, but the family gets a reward. A wedge tail. Perhaps it's Icarus that has found her wings at last and is soaring the ragged ridges of this ancient remnant of Gondwana. The Cradle Mountain Lake St. Clair National Park. 